Um, hi, everyone. My name is Yunbo Zhang. I'm presenting RiverMaker, enabling multi-directional and functional embedded 3D printing using a rotational QGOD platform. This work is done by me, my colleague Wei Gao, Diego Nazeta, Prof. Kasik Ramani, and Prof. Rima Sipra. We are all from School of Mechanical Engineering, Purdue University. So let's talk about the motivation of this work. In recent years, 3D printing has gained significantly attention from uh, uh, maker community, academia, and uh, industry to support the low cost and iterative prototyping for designs. 3D printing can generate 3D objects with uh, complex geometry without additional tooling and texture, uh, uh, refactoring. And uh, it can generate objects with heterogeneous and customizable materials. However, there are several uh, disadvantages for 3D printing. Uh, it usually requires sacrificial material to, to support the overhanging features, just like this case shown here. And it is difficult to embed functionalities into the printing process. Uh, in this case, uh, if we want to print, uh, if we want to print around this enclosure uh, with functional component inside and embed it into a 3D shape, it is difficult because uh, there will be collision between the printing head and the enclosure. And it is impossible to print below this uh, enclosure. So, and uh, the time-consuming process will slow down the uh, design iterations. So uh, actually these problems motivate our works. There are also uh, several related work trying to tackle these problems. Uh, prior all our works use skin frame structures and honeycomb structures to hollow a given 3D model for reducing material or improve the me mechanical property of the 3D model. Uh, however, these uh, hollowed space are unstructured and cannot be used as housing of functional components. Meanwhile, other researchers try to reduce the support materials. But no matter how they optimize the support generation, um, for, the method, for the printing method they used, which is uh, unidirectional 3D printing, will still require support materials. And the other researchers build up multi-axis 3D printing systems. Uh, this is a six-axis six 3D printer, which can print conformal features onto curved or irregular surfaces. And this is a, a six-axis robot printer. Uh, it can print these uh, reinforced structures. But these systems uh, require complex uh, control strategy for motion synchronization and uh, mechanical calibration. Uh, more importantly, for those largely slanted surfaces and the bottom surfaces, it is difficult for these printers to print onto due to the effect of gravity. Um, to speed up the printing process, uh, some researchers introduce the fast and a low fidelity uh, uh, fabrication method into the slow uh, but high fidelity fabrication. Uh, this wire print prints wireframes instead of the whole surface model. And this fabrication and planner uh, substitute the sub volume of a given 3D model by standard uh, Lego block or laser cart parts. So, what does RiverMaker do? In this example, we print a user customizable mouse. We generate a cuboid inside this mouse and separate the, mouse, the model into six pieces. And then we put all the functional components inside this cuboid and put it, it into the printer. After two rounds of revolving and printing, we can have a mouse. And we, we, even, put, we even print a side button there. OK, we snap off the two handles, and we can directly use it right after the printing. Uh, we customize the functionality and put a zoom window function uh, on, the, uh, on the side button. Actually, I'm using this mouse now, and uh, it, it works perfectly. 
And some of you uh, may already play with it in last, in last night's demo session, right? So uh, the working flow for River Maker is like this. We first generate a cuboid and embed all the functional components inside. Then we start the printing. There are two rounds of uh, revolving and printing. In the first round of uh, printing, we revolve this cuboid about uh, the out-of-plane axis. And uh, then we print the first four geometries. And we added two handles on the two opposite facets. Um, these two handles can be used as, uh, uh, for the second round of printing. In the second round of printing, we release the part and put the two handles into the gripper. Then we, re we revolve uh, this model along the implant axis and print the uh, remaining two geometry. After the, all the printing done, we just snap off the two handles. Now the question is how we generate the cuboid. So the objective of our cuboidization algorithms uh, actually has two objectives. The one is uh, this algorithm will generate a cuboid inscribed inside a model with as large a volume as possible. And the, separate, uh, the partition six geometry should have as little overhanging as possible. Uh, so we derive out these equations. Considering the time cons consumption and uh, effort on post-processing, we put uh, as little overhanging higher priority and put it into the hard constraint and uh, put the uh, larger volume as the objective function. Um, but directly solve this problem using nonlinear optimization is difficult because these two functions uh, are hardly evaluated due to uh, other, uh, hardly evaluated. Um, okay. So uh, we use a multi-loop uh, optimization algorithm to solve these problems. Given a 3D model, we first sample M, M's samples of orientations and then uh, generate M largest cuboid uh, using these orientations. And uh, we evaluate the overhanging features for this uh, M cuboid. Uh, as you can see, the printing sequence will also affects the uh, orientation uh, uh, of the overhanging features. A has overhanging features, but B hasn't. Uh, it is the same cuboid. So we also evaluate all the possible uh, printing sequence. It is totally 30 uh, printing sequence. And among them, we choose N candidate orientations and resemble around it, generate new orientations and generate new cuboid. Then we re-evaluate the overhanging features Eventually, we will have a cuboid and a six partition geometry with as little overhanging as possible and as large volume as possible. After we compute uh, the cuboid, we need to laser cut it. So we select a 3MMC acrylic sheet as a material because it can be uh, bonded with PLA firmly and we put interlocking piece patterns along the edge of the cuboid uh, to make sure the six facets can be pressed, uh, pressed fit together firmly. And we also put two slots onto the two opposite facets uh, to secure the cuboid during the printing. And these two slots can also be used in calibration, which I will talk about later. And it takes five to 10 minutes for cutting and around one minute for assembly. So the goal of our machine design is to enhance an existing 3D printer at a minimum cost and minimum complexity. So we modify this uh, market available uh, Artemic 2 3D printer by adding mechanical and electronical component onto it. We attach an arclate stand and two cantilevered uh, support plate onto this printing platform. And uh, we put two air cylinder onto the two plates. And uh, upon these two air cylinder, we put two solver, uh, solvers uh, connected with two air fingers. So there are three degree freedom for this mechanism. 
The first degree of freedom is a translation to fix it and release the cube out of base. And the second one is a rotation to revolve the cube out of facet around. And the third one is an angular motion to uh, apply a gripping force to the handles. So as I mentioned before, there are two rounds of revolving and printing. So in the first round, we just close up these two air fingers and fit it into the uh, slots. And then we do the printing and print the first four uh, geometry. And then we release the part and put the two handles into the air finger and print the rest two geometry. So before each uh, revolving, we need a calibration. Uh, for the first round revolving, we detect the corner point of uh, this cuboid. And for the second round, we detect the corner point of the slots. By knowing the cor corner point, we modify the uh, G code, and uh, the geometry can be printed at the right place accordingly. So we apply our real maker for these um, sculpture models with different overhanging features. And uh, real maker achieve zero support for these models. But meanwhile, uh, using the unidirectional traditional 3D printing, it still requires a large amount of uh, support materials. And we also uh, generate some functional uh, objects. So we shape this mouse using Play-Doh to ergonomically fit user's palm. And then we scan it and generate a cuboid. We also add slot cuts onto the partitioned geometries uh, to form the buttons and the recharging, uh, recharging port. We uh, match the slot cuts onto this cuboid to form these cantilever structures to alterate the internal switch when the external buttons are pressed. Then we do the printing, and we can directly use it after the printing. The second example, we uh, generate a wind-up toy. For this bubble saw model, why we choose this model? Because it has a large amount of uh, overhanging features. And uh, we put a wind-up motor and battery into the cuboid and print it. After getting out of printer, we just snap off the two handles and insert two LED eyes. And a Pikachu tail. Then wind it up. Then you can have some fun instantly. Yep. So, oh, okay, so we present real maker which is a multi-directional 3D printing with functional embedded. Um, the cuboidization algorithm we developed can generate the cuboid to save printing material and support. So we compare RealMaker versus the market available Artemaker 2. To make the comparison more fair, we explore the printing time and the printing material of Artemaker 2 by placing uh, the orientation by placing the object in different orientations. And uh, among them, we choose the minimum time and the minimum uh, material consumption to do the comparison. So throughout all seven tested models, we achieve totally support-free. And uh, we achieve 23% uh, on reduction on time and around 22% reduction on materials. And also, the cuboidization algorithm is, real, uh, is fairly fast. It took, it took 30 seconds to seven minutes for all models. And uh, compared with the printing process, uh, this time is a trivial. So the limitation of our real maker is the cuboidization algorithm works not good for those high uh, models with highly genius numbers and protrusion and models with protrusion and small features. Uh, it cannot generate a valid cuboid to partition the geometry. Well, we would like to address these problems in the future work. Uh, this work is partially supported by Purdue University and NSF. Um, that's all for my presentation, and thank you for your attention. Welcome your questions.
Patrick Bowdish, House of Platinum Institute. Very cool stuff. I really enjoy it. But, um, so I, I'd like to see more of this. And it's an interesting question, how? So more degrees of freedom always give you a chance to reduce support material, right? I mean, if you go from a three axis to a five axis, yep. you save support material. And you, know, you also add degrees of freedom, you also save, uh, save support material. What's your take on this? If you zoom out, I mean, if, you, if I have like one, two, three, four extra degrees of freedom, you know, like seven axis mm -hmm. devices and so on. What's your sense in what order would you spend them? You know, where does the lathe-like rotation mechanism come in? At what point would you tilt the platform? At what point would you have like the, you know, the extruder on a robot arm and so on? What's your sense of that? So you're talking about we, why we add this? No, 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 no. This is, it makes perfect sense. Oh, yeah. Like any, adding any degree of freedom to a 3D printer makes sense, right? So that's where yeah, people yeah. do it. The question is, you have, you have at least three different types of choices how to spend your degrees of freedom. You, you rotate the, the object. Yep. Other people have uh, yeah. add two degree, one or two degrees of freedom yep. to the extruder. Other people add one or two degrees of freedom to the platform. Uh -huh. So I was just wondering, I mean, you've spent a lot of time with this. You know, next time we're making a 3D printer, you know, would, would you say like the first degree of freedom is one rotation, the next is like, you know, how, how do you catch as many of the, you showed the ring, right? And every, every of these devices has a case where it fails. Yeah. So what's the cleverest combination? Maybe like one degree of rotation and then having like an extra degree of a tilt platform or how would they, or maybe this is something you figure out next year, I don't know. Oh yeah, uh, so uh, actually this question is a good question. And uh, the thing is we have to balance the complexity of the machine and the cost and, uh, uh, and the, uh, the function we can achieve. So for this work, why we choose this degree of freedom, that is we uh, want to, to enhance an existing 3D printer. That's, that's what the start, uh, starting point of, our, of this work. And uh, of course, uh, as you mentioned, if adding more degree of freedom, it can achieve better results. And for the models, I sh the field case, you're basically you're talking about this field case. I think, um, Actually, we, we have some uh, idea on this. Uh, one possible way to solve this is generate multiple cuboid instead of uh, only one. Of course, to realize it, we need to add more degree freedoms. As you mentioned, we need more uh, rotation or tilted mechanisms. And uh, also, another possible way, sorry, another possible way to solve it to use not only the cuboid base, but the general polyhedral base. But again, we need more complex mechanisms. And uh, I think the tilted, uh, the tilted mechanism is a good choice. And also, uh, I want to point out is, uh, adding, I would like to add uh, degree of freedoms onto, onto the objects, not the printing head. Because the printing head, if adding pr uh, degree of freedom on printing head, we will meet the same problem as I mentioned in the multi-access printer printers. So, did I answer your questions? 